I always wanted someone to be that for me. And then I never wanted anyone to feel less than. We all have demons. We all have issues. Um, there's no excuse for that. Finding this part of my family, though, it's been like, oh, God, I wish you guys were there when I was young. At a certain point in my life, I would say compassion is just weakness. But like as I've grown older, I realized compassion is putting others above yourself. Welcome to The Human Experience. I'm Jennifer Peterkin, and this is episode four, Joe's Story. I think Joe's story is really special. Joe happens to be a friend of mine who was kind enough to sit down with me when I asked to interview him. To be honest, this episode did not go the way I thought it was going to, in the best possible way. To me, Joe's story is a prime example of what can happen when you just sit down and listen with no other agenda. The story can take you places you were never planning on visiting, but sometimes those are the places that need light the most. Before we begin, I want to offer a trigger warning. This episode contains conversations about domestic violence, suicide, and drug use. Please proceed with care. What's up? Nothing. <laughs> Just trying to be gentle. You're fine. So, where do you want to start? Uh, the ancestry stuff? Yeah, but do you want to, like... Talk about you, your family growing up. Um, yeah, so didn't really know much of my mom's side of the family growing up. Mm-hmm. They're uh, Kensington Irish. Uh, I was raised around my dad's side, which is South Philly Italian. That's really funny because I thought you were 100% Italian. I thought I was too. I, I thought <laughs> I was growing up. I'd always say I'm 75% Italian, 25% Irish. Okay. I was sadly mistaken. So... You know, I didn't know much of my mom's side. I knew some of my dad's side, but I didn't really, like, click with any of them. Mm -hmm. Like, my cousins were all, like, theater nerds. And, like, I don't know. I thought (laughs) I was, like, not a nerd, but I had glasses, braces, was, like, overweight. So definitely was. But (laughs) um, Wait. Were your – are your parents fresh off the boat? My grandparents were. Okay. So my grandmother, Ursulina DeLuca, Mm -hmm. she was from northern Italy. My grandfather – Anthony Pellegrino Amato, he was from southern Sardinia, like uh, Sicily, like that that mm-hmm. region. Yeah. Uh, they came over when they were super young, met. My grandmother was a seamstress. Uh, my grandfather, I knew he was a soldier. I don't know much else. He passed away when I was five. Yeah. So I didn't know a ton about him. I knew he had a lot of brothers and sisters. I only met one of them, my Uncle Mickey. His name was Amedico. Uh, yeah, he was uh, – I met him at a public pool in Philly. He was changing outside with just a towel wrapped around him. And that was my introduction <laughs> to my great uncle. But um, I knew when I was young that my grandfather's sister had a child that uh, she ended up – she was only 14 years old. It was an inappropriate relationship, how the baby was conceived, like wasn't – planned or a boyfriend or anything like that just not a good situation was it consensual no from what i was told no yeah it was some neighborhood creep Mm. but nothing happened to him in the legal sense of course because what year was that like 1957 yeah yeah wow (laughs) yeah i know the exact year (laughs) right out the gate my dad was my dad was born in 57 okay and my my aunt or great aunt gave her child to a convent in 1957 so Fast forward to about two and a half years ago, uh, whenever the beginning of COVID was, like right before it, uh, I kept getting pressure from my wife telling me she wants to do this ancestry DNA stuff. Kept saying no. I had no interest in it. I mm-hmm. knew I didn't have any kids out of wedlock. Wanted to see if I was, uh, well, not kids out of wedlock because I did, but I mean, kids that you didn't kids know that about. I didn't know about. <laughs> but <laughs> how but, did you know? Um, For sure. Oh, I knew. I was. I have like. Like I said earlier, fat braces. Glasses. <laughs> I, <laughs> I was <laughs> pretty can narrow it down to like everyone. So <laughs> knew I was good. Uh, so I, I spit in the tube, logged in when I got my results, found out that I wasn't 75, 25 Italian and Irish. I was actually pr- uh, predominantly Italian, but Irish was right nipping at the heels. Mm-hmm. And I was like six other things. Never logged back in. Never logged back in. Were you so upset? Yeah, a little bit, honestly. 
growing up, you're told a certain thing the whole time, and then uh-huh. like you get older, and it's like. I wouldn't say Italian was part of my identity, but I used to wear velour suits to high school. So, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> pretty close. Like, Well, what and what do you think that is? Because, like, that's such an American thing, right? To have so much of your identity in your ancestry like that. Because it's, it's always divisive even when you're young. Like, everyone – I grew up in the city. It was a great mix of people, but – you know, you had the Greek neighborhood, yeah, the Irish neighborhood, the Italian neighborhood. Mm-hmm. You know, there's still a mix of people, but it was predominantly one would yeah. gather in the neighborhood. You got all your family functions, like, you know, seven fishes. Like, you got your uncles getting plastered online for Columbus Day. Like, you know what I mean? So you see that and you're like, oh, okay. This is who I am. Yeah, like, this is where I fit in. This is, you know, and I grew up watching, like, the Godfather, A Bronx Tale, Goodfellas, Casino, like all that stuff. And always thought like, oh, you know, that's a lot of these guys look like guys I grew up around. So yeah. this is especially Sopranos. Like that reminded me a lot of some of my family. So I was just like, oh, OK, like I get it. So I do this. Actually, it might have been a year before the whole COVID thing because I didn't log back into my app for forever after mm-hmm. I did it. And then I was getting Facebook messages from this guy, Sam. And I was just like, oh, some weirdo. You know what I mean? Like, whatever. He probably wants money or probably trying to get me to, like, buy his weight loss supplements or something. Oh, <laughs> the typical Facebook message you get from a stranger. Sure. Um, then he reaches out to my dad and my cousins and my sister and everything. And they're all telling me about it, but none of them responded to him. So I was I responded to him. We we're going back and forth. My wife sees it. She responds to him outside because she's kind of telling, like – you know, he's apprehensive to meeting people. Like, he doesn't know. And I'll be honest, like, I don't really look like my dad. I'm bigger than my dad. Uh, I had a brother who passed away December 12th, 2000, or I'm sorry, December 12th, 1984. It was, he was only alive for nine hours. And then I was born October 20th, 1985. Oh, wow. So doing the math and, like, all that, I'm like, am I just maybe a replacement? Because mm-hmm. Pasquale Jr. died. And then I'm born... Ten and a half months later, you know what I mean? So that was another reason I was kind of hesitant to do the ancestry thing because, like, if I found out my dad wasn't my dad, I really wouldn't give a shit. I would pursue my other family, Mm -hmm. you know, just to get to know them. But anyway, so it's a lot to know. It's a lot. It was like I didn't know, like, okay, so I'm going to meet this guy. I'm going to some stranger's house. Like, I didn't want to bring my kids or my wife with me because I didn't know what I was walking into. Mm -hmm. He lived almost an hour away, like – and then we got there. Right away, we clicked. Uh, we talked for hours, hung out at his house, found out our his dad was born slightly around the same time as my dad. Their wedding photo, his mother and father's wedding photo, is identical to my parents. Him, His dad and my father were the exact same tux, exact same color scheme, exact same color of the carpet in the photo as my dad's. It, it was... It was really strange. And as we started going back and forth, we had so much in common, like love of martial arts, political stuff, like everything. Like mm-hmm. I lined up with him and his family way more than my own sisters, my cousins who I've known my whole life. I'll tell you, in the last two and a half years, I've hung out with my ancestry family more than I've seen any of my other relatives besides my direct like mom, dad, sisters. Yeah. There's no judgment. Conversation flows better. Um, it's weird. Yeah, I, I told him because he has – I grew up with two sisters. He grew up with four brothers. So he's one of five boys. Mm. And I fit right in with all of them. It just – it seems like we're – it felt like I finally like found my brothers. You yeah. know what I mean? Because you it didn't have pretty, that at all growing up. I didn't. There was an, a couple older kids on my block. Like, like I said, I grew up in Philadelphia, like uh, row home. So there's a few older kids that, like, I hung out with that, like, I would say – I could say mentored me, but not in a good way. Taught me all the wrong stuff. Put me down, like, a not great path, you know, being a kid in the city and then being three to four years older than me. Like, thinking back right now, if my son at eight was like, hey, I'm going to go hang out with my 12-year-old friend or – I'd say no. Like yeah. Where my son at 10 is like, hey, I'm going to go ride bikes with my 14-year-old friend down the street. I'd be like, no, you're not. That's not right. He's too old, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But um, yeah. But so back then, that. that wasn't a Back thing. then, it wasn't weird and kind of like steel sharp and steel. Like, it was good that I hung out with him because it gave me a better, a more advanced outlook on life. Like, a more 
mature outlook on things. Like I could see where kids my own age might fall victim to certain things or mm-hmm. believe certain things. Like I didn't. Right. You know what I mean? When I was like seven, I was well aware there was no Santa Claus, Easter Bunny, probably even younger than that. So. Well, and it's not even that it was different. It's just that like we didn't even really know better back then. No, no, you know? no. It was acceptable. Yeah. And the same things happened back then that yeah. happened today. We just didn't have Facebook reminding us about it every yeah. five minutes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The crazy thing about Ancestry.com and all this was at the same time I did Ancestry, my mom did 23andMe. She found nothing. Nobody. There was like a few cousins. I still, if I log in right now, I probably have some random message from like a fifth cousin who lives in like New York or something. I just don't respond to them. I'm all set on my new family now. I feel like <laughs> <laughs> there's not enough hours in a day for any more family. I honestly think it's so funny because I've done Ancestry. And, I mean, I have people on there that are distant cousins that I've never met. I've never messaged any of them. And yeah. none of them have ever messaged me. Like, that hasn't been a thing. Sam's personality, if he probably found, like, a fifth or sixth cousin, he probably messaged them. Just because <laughs> he would always say, we family. We family, like, all the time, like, no yeah. matter what. And even recently, with everything going on with me taking custody of my niece and nephew, and they had to be relocated for like a week while things, you know, fizzled out, were looked into and all before they could live with us, he stepped right up. No mm-hmm. questions asked. I didn't even think to call my sisters, my parents, my aunts, uncles, no one. I called him right away. Yeah. Uh, he drove all the way from Sellersville to Chop in Philadelphia and picked them up, welcomed them into his home for eight days, you know, fed them, took them places. Yeah. Yeah. Like, just he's just a great person. Now, with my mom doing the 23andMe, eventually she decided she wants to do Ancestry.com. And this is where what I was worried about would happen with me happened to my mom. My mom sent me a screenshot after she got her results back saying that there was a 100% match for either a brother, grandchild, or uh, uh, just strict DNA match. And it turned out that it was my mom's brother. So my actual paternal grandfather... Passed away about four years ago, but I never knew him. Your the, paternal or maternal? Which one? Maternal, okay. right? My mom's dad. Yeah. So who I believe was my grandfather, I never met him because he was an abusive alcoholic piece of shit. So he would beat my grandmother. Um, not a good person. Back in the early to mid-60s, they broke up. Uh, my grandmother started dating someone who owned a shop around the corner Apparently not much better of a guy, I guess, in the neighborhood she lived in. It was slim picking. She lives in Kensington, Port Richmond area. And uh, so after they dated for a few months, uh, my grandfather, Mickey, came back into the picture. So they broke it off and my grandma was pregnant. So she gave birth to my mom. My mom, Mickey, my grandma all assumed that my mom was Mickey's child. Up until she was young, she was going to visit with him, you know, for the weekend, to spend the summer, all that. He still wasn't a good person. Abusive, verbally, physically, you know. Uh, my grandfather, who I've always known as my grandpa, James McKenzie, that's the guy who was, you know, the guy who I always call grandpa. Like, he filled in, like, wasn't perfect either, you know, whatever. My mom turns out she has three brothers and a father who she found through ancestry, our three brothers are all younger than her, but all good people. Like one owns a venue out in uh, Ben Salem called The Fuge. He has a restaurant too, and uh, my other one's special ops. Works with like NASA and Space Force right now. He's always all over the place. And my other uncle is a colonel in the army, I think. And it's such a small world. He was living on the same base as my sister and her husband at the time in Georgia. When my mom found him, he was living like 10 minutes from my sister. Wow. Yeah. So Ancestry opened a lot up. I've got to meet my mom's side of the family too. They're all, they're all cool people. So like growing up, you had a close family. Uh, I had. In that you spent a lot of time with each other. I spent a lot of time with my direct family. Okay. My sister's. My dad, my mom, my dad had a boat and we'd always joke that the boat was his favorite kid. That 100% range true, though. I could be dying of some kind of insane ailment, and if it was time to dewinterize the boat, he'd be gone. Like, <laughs> it's, um, so are you close with your parents? Close-ish. I, I'd say I don't have, like, the average relationship with my parents where, you know, people talk to their parents every day, all that. It's, I wouldn't say I was a difficult kid. Uh, 
my dad was he worked a lot, so he was kind of like uh, short fused when he got home. And if my sisters messed up, my dad would look for something that I did wrong so he could physically take it out on me where mm-hmm. he wouldn't do it to my sisters. So then when I was like 15, 16, I was a blue belt in Taekwondo, bigger than him. So all that kind of stopped. <laughs> but like, I wouldn't say there's animosity there still. Like, I forgave him. He never apologized. Probably didn't think he did anything wrong. But whipping me with belts all the time, kicking me, punching me, probably wasn't the best way to, you know, grow up. Yeah. Um, my mom has severe depression. It'll never, she'll never get it treated. She'll never talk to anyone about it. But it's... She's admitted it. Like, she she had a horrible childhood, too, you know, so it's understandable. Finding this part of my family, though, it's been like, oh, God, I wish you guys were there when I was young, you know? Yeah. Like, I even, January, I flew down because Sam's mom was sick, and she had just got out. She was supposed to pass away the prior year. She came out of a coma, was able to go home, was talking again, walking with the assistance of, like, a walker or cane stuff. So we basically went down to say goodbye to her. And she just talked to me the whole time saying, like, she's so glad her boys have more family now and, like, all that. And then we said goodbye to her uh, a few months ago. Mm. She finally, you know, succumbed to her illnesses. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's just crazy, like, meeting all these people and all the yeah. people just spitting in a tube. Like, yeah. It's, it's crazy because you hear about this kind of in the abstract, but not necessarily happening to everybody. Yeah. And of course, you know, it's not like this huge scandal, but you're fi- you found family that you didn't know you had and for you it has become they've become part of your everyday family. Yeah. And that doesn't always happen either. Do you think that part of that is because you were searching for something more in family? I would say, yeah. So my god, my godmother, I don't speak to her anymore because of, she was always verbally and borderline physically abusive to me as a kid. And, like, I just dealt with it. You know, she was a lady. Didn't hurt too much when she would hit me or, like, dig her nails in my neck and open a store door with my face. That's happened several times. But uh, it was like she would always comment on my weight. And I was always a pudgy kid. Grew into a very pudgy adult. But <laughs> she started saying stuff to my daughter. Oh, gosh. About her weight. So that was it. And that's the person I was probably closest with in my family. She would like always. She would be the one babysitting. Was us, that an aunt? Me. That was my aunt. My aunt Rita. Yeah. Which, on which side? My dad's sister. Okay. Yeah. So she, I, she loved me. Like she always referred to me as like I'd be her son because she doesn't have any kids and stuff like that. But it's kind of like breaking the chain sure. of abuse, and I don't see that. Like Sam and his family are always just so nice to yeah me and my kids. Yeah. You obviously have experienced a lot of abuse in your life growing up, whether it was directly, which you certainly have, but indirectly as well. Like you saw or you heard about your your parents and their backgrounds. And what we know about abuse is is that it is very cyclical and it does get passed down from generation to generation until you until someone decides to break the cycle. And that's not just like one decision. It's happen. It happens over and over again because you have to unlearn um, patterns of behavior. So I see you and the way that you are with your children and the way that you are with your family. And it's very different from how you were raised. What was it for you that was like, I can't, I have to break the cycle. I can't keep doing this. When I was, um, 14, I tried to take my own life. And it was, like, a lot going on. Like, I moved out of the city into the suburbs. Didn't want to. Everything I had was within walking distance of my house. All that just, like, I know my parents were doing the better thing, moving me out from, you know, Mayfair, Frankfurt area to Havertown, the suburbs. But, like, everything I knew was nearby. All my friends were nearby. Um I took, like, theology freshman year of high school and stuff like that, and then I was thrown into Haverford, which was, like, I went from an all-boy Catholic school to, like, an advanced suburban school, and, like, I took Spanish. I knew how to say the Our Father. I knew how to bless myself. I knew how to say my name, and I got all A's in Spanish freshman year. When I got to Haverford, it was block scheduling. I had the second semester, and these people were fluently speaking to each other, and I it was just – it was too much. Like, it was all too much. I felt like – 
I didn't really have anything to look forward to. I felt like I didn't want to continue down like everything that was going on because when I would voice my opinions or my distaste, I would be met with like, oh, you're ungrateful, did all this for you guys. Like, And now as an adult, I get it. But at the time, I was just in such a dark place. I'm not going to get into details, but when like I came through everything, I don't ever want to make anyone feel like that, like ever. I had to break that. I didn't want anyone else getting to that low of a point in their life because of me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, I just had to stop it. I've also adapted that in other things. Like if I see someone picking on someone who's like smaller than them, mm -hmm. weaker, or maybe someone who just doesn't have like a strong enough voice to stick up for themselves, I will 100% intervene at whatever cost it is. You know what I mean? Which is what I'm doing, what I decided to do right now with my niece and nephew. They were going to go into Philly foster care and I just, because they're victims. They were victims of physical abuse, 100% neglect and all that. And I just don't like, I never wanted to feel powerless, which is probably why I get up at five in the morning and lift weights five days a week. But like, I didn't want anyone else to feel powerless or feel that like I wouldn't protect them if given the opportunity. Yeah. So that's when I just ended it all. There was, there's no, none of my kids will ever be disciplined in the way I was. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I know I didn't answer the question probably totally. No, no, no. That was great. It's just the... It's an incredible thing to move from, you know, having that experience and making that decision and then actually being able to follow through with that. It, it really is incredible because patterns of behavior that we learn, especially when we're young, it, it, they're very easy to fall into and fall back into. And it takes a lot of work to decide to do something differently. Do you think that your, you know, the people that raised you, I mean, obviously your parents, but the people you were around when you were younger and even their um, elders, their parents and stuff, do you think they would have described that behavior as abusive? Uh, I don't know, because my grandma on my mom's side was like, she shot somebody before. She was pretty hardcore. Like she, yeah, <laughs> I know a guy was trying to break into the house and she shot him in the back and in the ass while he was running away. Wow. Yeah. I think she paralyzed him if I remember correctly. So I guess they wouldn't, my grandma would say stuff all the time to me. Like my dad's mom, she watched me when I was a kid. She passed away when I was 10, uh, the day before Christmas Eve. Um, she would say stuff. She would say stuff to my aunt too. The one I told you that would say stuff to me all the time. Yeah. yeah she would. You know, well, like, and that's what it is, right? Yeah. Like, so your aunt got it from her mom who yeah. then passed it on to you. Yeah. And not that that's in any way excusable, but we see the patterns through generations. Yeah. And a lot of times I think what's so interesting is especially when we go back, it's like whatever was we, we were talking earlier about what's socially and culturally acceptable. Yeah. So back then it wasn't abusive to talk to and treat your kids like that necessarily. And now we know better. We, we now know how much damage that can do yeah. to a person, no matter what age they are. So, yeah, I think it's a really interesting conversation about the cycle of abuse, but also defining what abuse is and what abusive behavior is. I prefer the physical abuse over the verbal when I was a kid because the physical I would heal from quicker. The mm -hmm. verbal stuck with me a lot. You know yeah. what I mean? It would like repeat to me. Whereas if I got punched in the face or, you know, whipped with a belt or pushed down the steps or whatever, I'd get up, brush it off and be fine. Which also, getting hit by a 30-something-year-old man who's like, you know, 200-something pounds and really strong. I get into a fight at school, it's like nothing. So that was the only, I guess, benefit of the physical Jeez. abuse. <laughs> like, I think you punch harder. <laughs> like, come on, bro. Like, But, yeah. This one from Ancestry to like really dark, really fast. Though. No, this is, but this is your story. This yeah. is it. And then I think it's really – it's why – what happened through ancestry means so much to you. Yeah, it's like a second chance for me. Oh, I, like I said, I still talk to my mom and dad or welcome at my house whenever, you know what I mean? Um, my kids go there from time to time. I don't send my son as much. I feel like they're not equipped to handle my son because mm. like high energy, eight year old, like wants to play, wants to be rough, like stuff like that. So my daughter just lays on her couch or bed and watches TikToks. So <laughs> <laughs> it's like she can go down there. Yeah. 
But if they did go down there and they came back and I was told they said something, that would definitely be an issue. If if anyone were to cross the line and stuff, I still hold that part of it in me. You know what I mean? Like sure. that part of the resentment in me. So, And I think that's fair. I also think it's it's awesome that you said out loud the fact that the psychological and verbal abuse was a lot harder to yeah. deal with than the physical abuse because we're still not – fully understanding that, right. um, that, you know, of, of course, physical abuse is not acceptable and is never okay, but it doesn't touch the damage that psychological abuse does. Yeah. Without a doubt. You can recover from a busted lip or like a bruised rib or whatever. It's the, the stuff that you're called that makes you feel like lower than dirt that sticks with you. Yeah. The, uh, the removal of, of your dignity. Yeah, basically. Sure. There was one time my dad, I don't know, maybe I was seven, trying to make me wear a diaper because he said I was a baby. Yeah, outside wow. of the house. Yeah. And I remember that was, I went and got a baseball bat and was going to hit him with it. And like that was the whole thing. Like, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, all stuff I wouldn't carry on to, you know, my kids. Like, sure, I sure. End it, you know what I mean? Yeah. How are your, how's your relationship with your sisters? All right. Uh, my little sister, it's a typical little sister. She reaches out to me. I don't really reach out to her. Um, she's uh, she's married to an army ranger, so she moves a lot. So that kind of sucks. Um, if she called me at like 2 in the morning and said she needed me, like I would be in upstate New York within the five hours or probably less it takes to get there. Yeah. Uh, my older sister, um, we get along. Like, we do talk. We are two opposite ends of everything. So, but I talk to her, like, with everything going on right now with trying to get full custody of my niece and nephew and switch their schools and all. My sister's really high up in the school district. Mm. So, like, we've reached out to her, you know, yeah, just for, like, advice and different things. And so you have taken from from your wife's side of your family your niece and nephew into your house yes uh, and you are currently trying to get custody of them full custody yes because they have been in an abusive and neglectful household oh my god yeah so what is it i mean i this kind of i think is a redundant question but but why why bother why go through all of this because no one deserves to go through that they didn't pick their parents you know what i mean um believe it or not seven years ago i was still working at a body shop right outside of southwest philly and i know people say this all the time but i got like a feeling that something wasn't right and i kept getting the feeling and it was like a solid 10 minutes like in the pit of my stomach and i tried calling my wife and she wasn't answering so something told me drive by the house they live in southwest philly a couple minutes from where the shop was I drive by and my wife is banging on the door. No idea. She was supposed to be at work in Bala Kimwood at the time. I got out. You could see through the smashed window of this house. Same window still smashed to this day, seven, eight years later. My wife's mother passed out on the recliner. And off to her left was the baby, who's now eight, laying on the couch with nothing around her. Nothing at all to hold her in place. She was just sleeping. There was nobody else in the house. We got the mom to wake up. She opened the door. We looked in the house. There's pill, open pill bottles just sitting out, garbage everywhere, reeks of cigarettes, and honestly, like, human shit. Really bad. Really bad situation. We called CYS, called the police. Um, because it's southwest Philly, I waited about an hour and a half. No cops ever showed up. Uh, they finally showed up eight hours later with a caseworker. At that point... The mom had come out of her heroin coma. Uh, the parents were back in the house. Like, basically, they do meth to come out of their downers. So they're basically saying, we just wanted the kids. The part of the ceiling's missing at that time. There's no food in the fridge. But Philly police made the decision that since there was four adults in the house, the kids were fine. Fast forward, uh, my wife's mother said she's getting sober last year. Calls us, oh, I'm doing great. Uh because of COVID, though, there's no beds left at the shelter, so I'm either going to have to go to this place in Chester or I'm going to have to go back into the the crack house where the kids are, where my wife's brother and his girlfriend are and her stepdad. And 
So my wife's crying. I was like, tell your mom she can come stay with us. So for like the first four or five months, I was driving her to the clinic whenever the weather was bad down in Philly so she can get her stuff, buying her food, buying her clothes, everything she needed. Um, She started smoking cigarettes in my basement bathroom, which I freaked out about. And then uh, she started bringing the kids over, though. And I noticed the boy would go to the bathroom about 10 times an hour. Both his eyes would roll into his head a lot. Um, he'd always complain about his stomach hurting. Uh, they're really shy, really timid, scared. Uh, finally, we end up kicking her mom out because she clearly relapsed and didn't want her around my family anymore. I brought all her stuff back down to the house in southwest Philly. Um, so I saw the kids again. Didn't look like the greatest. Like At this point, there's aluminum foil over the windows because they're all smashed. I can see part of the roof's gone. Like, so just, they're living in complete, complete and utter, you know, shambles. Uh, fast forward now, September 6th, I didn't get home to like quarter to seven. I get home, my wife's outside crying on the phone with pen and paper. Right away, I thought it was my daughter did something at school and we were getting a call from school and it was whatever. It's a caseworker. They finally got their way into the house due to truancy. Um, they missed 105 days of school. Oh my gosh. Uh, during COVID, they didn't go at all virtually. They never signed in. So they're there, which the whole CYS thing, it, it's crazy because going to that house for truancy, you can tell it's a crack house just being outside of it. It's just clearly a crack house. Like, um, they got the cops in there. I saw pictures from inside the house. Both of the children were sharing a bed with their grandparents, a full size mattress that had feces, blood and urine stains all over it. I'm now told that the dog used to get sick laying in the bed and the grandpa would just shake the sheet off and put it back on. Yeah. So these kids were sleeping there. There was no running water in the house, no gas, no stove, no toaster oven, no microwave, no refrigerator. There was a mini fridge in the middle of the living room that had nothing in it. Um, the boy now has, he has no teeth because he has a few teeth in the back of his mouth because he was given Pepsi and um, chocolate milk his whole life. No, uh, they haven't seen a doctor since 2018. These are all the things we're finding out. And they're basically said they can either go into foster care or they can come to our house. I agreed they can come to our house. So I, I just wanted to get them out of that situation. I feel like um, the mom keeps saying, like, she's got to get clean, she's going to get clean. You've been doing this for 11 years. Uh, she actually lost a child from using while she was pregnant. The baby was only alive for about an hour. The codependency I noticed right away, like everything the little girl would go to do, the brother would feel the need to like, you know, you got that? You want me to do it? Are you okay? Like, And then I was just like, you know, intervene, showing him that she's safe now, all that. Uh, we went to my ancestry cousin's house because when he found out about it, he was like, he was draining his pool and he refilled his pool just so the kids could go swimming and have a fun time. Wow. Yeah. So we went up there. <laughs> uh, we're told by everyone that this kid can swim. Uh -oh. He jumps in three feet of water and starts flailing around. And me just, you know, using common sense, I'm like, hey, bud, stand up. Just stand up. You're like four foot something. Stand up. So we had to pull him up. He was fine. He was scared. I pulled him aside. My cousin also has a hot tub. He's also the hot tub king. That's what he refers to himself as. Okay. Kind of a big deal. He um so I put him I put him over to the hot tub. I'm like, just hang out here. If you're gonna go again, let me know. After five minutes he tried again. He went in, walked in this time instead of cannonballing. And uh he enjoyed it. He was in the pool for hours, loved it, pulled him aside, told him how proud I was, all that, and that's when I noticed the bruising. Cause I had him in the light on the deck and all that. And, um I started asking him about it and he started basically reading a script word for word. And then when I asked him, I was like, no, dude, I don't think that's how that happened. Tell me. And same thing, word for word again, wouldn't make eye contact with me. So I let it go. He kept saying a doorknob hit him on his hip. Kid's not tall enough for a doorknob to hit his hip. The next day, he's coming up from my basement, walking by, walks by the doorknob. I point out to him, the doorknob's actually by your rib cage. How'd it happen? Back and forth, he admits that his parents, if he were to play in the house, his parents would come out and beat him. Grandparents would do the same thing. They would hit him with stuff, hold him down, punching on him, all that. If he asked to go outside, same deal. And that's when I, like, I made the solid decision that they weren't going back. Yeah. Ever. Like, ever. There's, we all have demons. We all have issues. Um, 
there's no excuse for that. This kid is malnourished. Um, he functions at the level of like a five or six year old. He's 10. My son, who's a grade below him, explains homework to him, reads things to him. Uh, like I said, he needs glasses, needs dental work, needs counseling. Uh, uh, we believe he has diabetes because he pees so much. He's always lethargic, having pain. So, like, all these things we're going to get addressed. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to overwhelm him right away. But sure. that's when I made the decision, like, you guys are never going back. Yeah. And the mom seems to be on board with it right now, but she's also on a a large amount of heroin all the time. So, but from what I'm told, she needs to get a house. They both need to get sober and all that. But I'm, I don't care if I have to pull all the equity out of my house. Like, I'm going to make sure we get custody of these kids. Yeah. They're never going back. Because there's, there's certain things. Like, I know addicts. One of my ancestry cousins actually struggles with addiction. One of the sweetest guys I know, though. You're a horrible person at your core if you do this to children. And, yeah, so basically everything they have now like they had alfredo sauce for the first time <laughs> they had a pretzel dog for the first time an ice cream sandwich for the first time just all these simple things like him having a, his own sonic bedspread on the bed i bought him he, he acted like i he went outside and i had a brand new xbox with a projector screen and all this <laughs> stuff for him it was like the coolest thing ever like, yeah so that's kind of made it easier for me to decide, like, there's no way you're going back. So it's been 23 days. The parents have made no attempt to get sober. The father hasn't even reached out at all. So, yeah. I mean, that, and that is a whole other conversation, yeah. too. But you have this thread of family that runs through your life. You know, you've had your share of adversity and not just in your family, but you know, with your wife's family and just all of that, that comes into marrying into a family and you know, your extended family and whatever you've had your share of adversity, but through it all family is still a touch po- touchstone for you. And it still means something to you. Yeah. And you are that lighthouse for people that when they need you, you're there. Like you are the constant, you are the person that everybody can count on. Um, it's tiring. <laughs> I was just, yeah. So a couple things it's there. Just, like which what does it, my addiction of energy drinks? <laughs> well, God, sleep. yes. Everybody, <laughs> if you hear about Joe dying from a heart attack, it's Sue C four. Yeah. <laughs> what is that like to be the person that is just? Like, constantly on. You're constantly the one that has to be dependable. Um, And have you always felt like that? Yeah. I, I like, um, so like I said before, I grew up in row homes in Philly. Um, There's, like, a pretty large age gap between me and the guys I would hang out with. So there was a lot of girls on my street, and uh, there were a lot around my age. And the 60, I was the 6200 block, the 6100 block, had a lot of, like, boys our age, but for some reason it was like a turf war between their block and our block. <laughs> so I would pick up for the girls all the time when they were being bullied or mistreated as a kid. And that's what made me start doing martial arts because I figured if I, when I was young, if, <laughs> if I'm going to keep doing this, I need to know how to defend myself. And just I always wanted someone to be that for me. Mm. And there wasn't many people. I could think of one person when I was a kid – And he had a really rough life. Like his parents weren't really around. His aunt and uncle were raising him. He lived one house down from me. And like he was always there for me. And him doing that for me made me be like, I'm going to be that for anyone who I can be. And him like, for example, I go to walk to the corner store and there was this one kid. He's about five years older than me. And it was my birthday. And he grabbed me and was like, what did you get for your birthday? Like money? And like – out of nowhere, the guy's name, we call him Antony, just rocked the shit out of this guy <laughs> and threw him on the hood of a car and started choking him. And to me, that was like the coolest thing ever. I was probably, <laughs> it was probably, he was overly violent for the situation, but like, <laughs> and then I never wanted anyone to feel less than. These kids did nothing wrong. Like the kids, my niece and nephew, they did nothing wrong. They don't deserve this. My wife left the house when she was 12 because her mom stabbed her with a corkscrew. Like, But she suffered with addiction. She was in an abusive relationship with my wife's father. So when she tried to get sober, I made sure I did everything I could 
to help her get as many days as she could. Yeah. And it's just old habits die hard, you know? Yeah. It's, so, it's, you know, we know it's more than just a compulsion. It's an yeah. actual disease and, and there's understanding there, but that doesn't make the ripple effect that it has. Okay. Yeah. And there was something said to me when I was young, which was, I was never been very religious. I went to Catholic school, kindergarten, and ninth grade, that the devil's work is done by idle hands. Mm. Like, and I've always just tried to keep busy. God, I know. Yeah, it's it's nonstop. Like, yeah. I just keep going. You know what I mean? Also, it's like the shark mentality. I stop moving, I'm going to die. Mm. You know what I mean? I stop moving, the C4 is going to wear off. <laughs> it's going to crap out. But, and I dropped my phone for the third time. So, I know, I heard it. <laughs> <laughs> I know you. We're friends. So, I know... Uh, all of this already. And I know about your life and I, I, I've seen you show up time and again, not just for your family, but for pretty much anybody that needs anything. And so you are always that person and it's not just family, but you kind of treat people like that. Where does that come from? My childhood, I guess. Uh, like I said, wanting someone to be that person for me. Also, uh, Bob, you remember Bob? He would reach out to me a lot, and I'd always talk to him. And he was a very, not to speak ill of the dead, a very strange guy, like the things he would talk about and all that. When he passed away, he had left me a voicemail uh, the day before. And, you know, as you know, he went and took his own life the next day. His girlfriend reached out to me and said that if I just would have hung out with him more or been there for him more, he probably wouldn't have done this. And that just kind of reinforced the fact that like no matter what I have going on, as long as it's at no cost to my direct family, I need to be there for as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. Cause if one interaction could stop someone or make a positive impact a couple of years ago, I went to Wawa and the cashier calls me by my first name and I'm just like, oh, okay. Like I looked to see if I had like my badge hanging out or something. And he's like, you don't remember me, do you? And I honestly didn't remember him because when I knew him, he was a little goth kid with like painted nails, black hair and like all that. So apparently he and I walked home from school the same way. And one day someone was beating him up, like mistreating him, a guy a lot bigger than him. And I just went up, intervened. And the guy's like, who are you? His brother? And I was like, yeah, I am. You got a problem? And like took up for him. He basically said that day or that time was like a really dark time for him. And me doing that changed everything. That kid used to torture him from the time they were in middle school together to start in high school. And me just doing that stopped him completely. Yeah. And he, like, thanked me and all that. I had no – I didn't remember doing it. I had no idea his name, who he was or anything. And, like, him saying that that, like, changed him also kind of reassured, like, I got to stay this path because, like, where, like, other people maybe – can't speak up or afraid to speak up. I'm not afraid. I'll speak up. I'll say whatever I want. You need to beat me up. Yeah. You can try. And if you do, <laughs> I'm just going to come back angry with, <laughs> like, with more intent. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's really powerful to, to it's just a really powerful sentiment. And I, I do think it's true. I do want to mention, however, that it's, you're not responsible for, other people. I, I've come to terms with that because it wasn't just the Bob thing hurt. You know what I mean? Like her saying that, like I knew she was hurt in the time, but at the same time, I just reassured myself. It's like he was in all this extracurricular stuff that I couldn't have around myself or my family, mm -hmm. you know? So I made the right choice at the time. And there was a lot of other demons in that guy's life that led to his decision. But right. like for a while it did kind of mess with me. You know what I mean? Like Of course. And I appreciate you acknowledging that she was just in a in a very hurting place, but it was not okay that that was said to you because that wasn't ever I mean, going to be your She sent me a wild inappropriate message like a month after that. Well, that wasn't about like blaming me for stuff. That's I guess she was like lonely or whatever. Oh, no. I know. Oh, my God. Yeah. Okay. Blocked. Well, yeah. <laughs> good, good. Yeah. I'm glad to hear it. Um, yeah, I, I think there is there's something to be said for the person that is just aware enough to know that the small things matter and showing up for people matters more than anything else. Yeah. Do you feel like you have that in your life now? 
Uh, yeah, I do. Like your brother, for example, uh, one of my engine sees in my car. He showed up, brought me some five guys, <laughs> offered to bring me to his house and all that. Like, you've been there for me. Yeah, my wife, my best friend, Bob. He's not the Bob that we were just talking about, a different Bob. He's he's there for me a lot. My cousins, like when all this was going on, my cousin Sam probably called me like 20 times a day yeah. to the point where I was like, what now, dude? <laughs> like, <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not any better than I was 20 minutes ago. <laughs> all right. Like, <laughs> but yeah, it was, you know, I feel like I've gained like almost a second family. Well, I think that's awesome. So there's a question that I ask everybody. What does compassion mean to you through the lens of your experience? What is compassion? At a certain point in my life, I would say compassion is just weakness. But like as I've grown older, I realized compassion is putting others above yourself, putting others in a – not just seeing things as black and white, being able to explore the gray area. For example, like with the, my niece and nephew's parents, yeah, they're, they're pieces of shit. They've done wrong to these kids their whole life. But the other side of me is like – the mom, her her dad was taken from her when she was a baby. Her mom was in addiction her whole life. Uh, you know, the father, his, both his parents were in active addiction. His older brother is a total piece of shit. You know, he just didn't have people there for him. So that's where the compassion kicks in for me where I like – I feel for people. Like I feel for – you could be wrong. You could be doing the worst thing. But I understand sometimes why. Mm -hmm. Like – I understand why they can't love their kids the way they're supposed to because they were never loved, you know? And it's like where I feel I didn't get a lot of that as a kid instead of pushing that onto mine. I'm like over, over loving to them where the point where they tell me to leave them alone a lot. Like <laughs> it's, yeah. But uh, compassion is understanding when you don't need to understand. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like most people would write people off, but like, you got to look deeper. You know what I mean? Everyone has their own cross they bear every day. You don't know what that person's going through. You don't know why that person is the way they are. Some people might see a junkie, but that could be someone who's been abused their whole life and just needed to, the pain to stop, you know? So I guess that's what <laughs> – compassion. Actually, Webster's Dictionary defines <laughs> compassion. Stop it. <laughs> that was a fabulous answer. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and just because of we've been talking about it so much, what does family mean to you? What is family? Family's not blood, in my opinion. Family's the people that are there for you when you need them. Family's the people that get you for you and don't expect anything out of you. Um, my cousin Sam always says, I'm ride or die, which means whatever he needs, I'm usually there. Like moving a hot tub off the side of a mountain at nine o'clock at night. Just making dinner because he actually had a job or he was coaching 20 minutes away. So I make a meal and invite them into my house and all that. Uh, family's just people, people that you want to be around. People that, I don't know, people that make you feel like you don't have to be on edge. People you could just be yourself around. People that are there, basically anyone who's, people that are there for you consistently. Yeah. Like, blood doesn't make you family. Actions make you family. You know, love makes you family. That's family. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Yep. And to quote Vin Diesel, all you need is family. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think we have to end there because yeah. there's nothing more to say. Thank you so much for listening to The Human Experience. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please subscribe, share it with others, and leave a rating and review on your favorite platform. Everyone has a story, and I'd love to hear yours, so be sure to check out the show notes for more information about how to stay in touch. Do good and take care.